What if I told you that every time you use ChatGPT or another LLM to help you write an essay, you're actually training your brain to think less? In a recent study out of MIT and the MIT Media Lab, researchers measured students' brain activity with EEG headsets while they were tasked with writing an essay. The students were split into three groups. One group was given ChatGPT, one group was given a traditional search engine like Google, and the third group was given no help whatsoever. They just had to use their own brain to write the essay. One thing I want to point out before we continue is that the study is still a preprint. So it's been uploaded to the archive, which is a preprint server before things get actually peer reviewed. So take everything I say with a bit of a grain of salt, just because again, this is not something that has been completely validated through the peer review process. But I still think that the results and what the report contains is still very interesting. And while the results might be a little bit distressing to confront, they may not all be that surprising, honestly. One thing I would like to point out as well is that the full preprint is over 200 pages, and I'll admit I didn't read the entire thing. I only read the parts that I found to be the most interesting and the most relevant to what I was curious about. So if you want to read the full report, please go take a look at the link in the description below so you can get the full story if you want it. The study was conducted with 54 participants spread across five universities across the greater Boston area. These included universities like MIT, Harvard, Wellesley, Northeastern, and Tufts. Each session that the participants took part in involved a headset setup, a calibration task, 20 minutes of writing, and then a post-writing interview about what they wrote. An interesting aspect of this study is that they also had participants in certain groups switch. So there was a point in the study where they invited people from the LLM only group and the brain only group to effectively switch into the different groups later on in the study. And then they looked at the performance of those individuals who had sort of switched, the so people who went from LLM to brain and brain only to LLM. And the results and the differences there were pretty surprising too. Now, there was a lot of analysis in terms of the neuroscience and the different kind of frequency bands like the alpha, beta, theta, and delta waves. I, I don't really have uh, a good framework to talk about that. So I can only really talk in generality, so I apologize. And there was also analysis done with natural language processing, looking at the linguistic structure of these essays produced by the different teams. To summarize this in the simplest way that I can possible without having to force you to read the 200 pages, effectively the people who only use their brain showed the highest level of brain activity, whereas the people who were using ChatGPT to write their essays showed the lowest level of cognitive neural activity. and the people who use traditional search engines like Google were in the middle, which kind of tracks with what I would have expected in the first place. Even though the study's results kind of went how I would have just guessed from the onset, there were still some concerning details that I think I should share with you. For example, people who use LLMs to write their essays often would struggle with just remembering what they had just written. So they would be interviewed by the researchers after their writing session was over for the day, and they would be asked to quote from the essay they had literally just written, but with the help of, of ChatGPT. And they often just could not cite specific lines, sentences, or paragraphs. Now you can contrast that with the people who used their own brain and were able to, with very high fidelity, tell you exactly what they had written because, well, they had to struggle and think about it and put words onto that page. Another topic that was brought up was the concept of ownership and taking ownership of one's work. Now, the people who used their own brain, didn't have search, didn't have ChatGPT, were the ones who unsurprisingly felt the most ownership over their work because, well, they had to struggle to put words on the page. Another interesting aspect of the study was the use of natural language processing to analyze the linguistic structure of the different participants' essays. And the thing that stood out to me, which is not that surprising, is that the homogeneity of the large language model group, as in their essays just sounded so similar to each other because the LLMs just have this distinctive, soulless kind of writing that the human judges easily picked up on. In contrast, the brain-only group showed the most diversity in the way that they wrote their essays because it seemed like everyone was able to tap into their own unique writing voice and produce just linguistically different kinds of essays. And again, this ties into the feeling I think that participants had of ownership and 
levels of satisfaction, which was also a parameter that was measured in the study in the sense that people who did all the work on their own with just their brain reported the highest levels of satisfaction of their work, whereas people who used search and LLMs, particularly LLMs, had the lowest level of satisfaction. So let's talk a little bit about the broader implications of this study. I know there are a lot of things I didn't include in this video from that study, but again, it's like 200 pages, so take the time to read through it if you want to know. But I think there's already enough here that we can discuss about what does this mean for the future of us humans interacting with these large language models. Well, one of the concerning things that I think that this relates to is that video I saw that went viral like a week ago of that UCLA graduate who was showing his laptop screen at the UCLA graduation. And I believe he was just showing Chad GPT and it became like this viral meme of, of, of just oh, look, college students aren't even really using the brain anymore. They're just using ChatGPT to graduate from like the top public universities in the United States. And this it speaks to like a broader issue, I think, because in some ways we are incentivized to use these large language models because they do help us in some ways in terms of productivity at work, for example, if we're, if we're doing a job that is mostly behind a desk on a computer. But at the same time, the study also implies that we're also kind of atrophying our brain muscles, our cognitive load, we're, we're increasing our cognitive depth, where we're trading the short-term gains of convenience for the long-term diminishing of our cognitive ability. So what is the answer? How do we combat this? Well, I don't have all the answers, unfortunately, but I do have some ideas as to what I think we can do to protect ourselves from letting our brains get cognitively weak. And I want to bring in an analogy with physical muscle building and, and strength. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about health because I am someone who's had health issues in the past. And I had a number of injuries where I had to uh, learn how to walk again, basically. I had to be on crutches and I had to use a cane to walk around. And I remember talking to my healthcare providers and you know, as soon as I could get off the crutches or get off the cane, they really wanted me to because they said that the longer that I rely on these on these assistive devices, it's like that link between my my brain and the body part that was that was being afflicted is just going to get weaker and weaker and it's going to take longer for me to just remember how to use it naturally. And that's kind of how I see this issue with the cognitive debt in the sense that the less we engage our brains, the 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 weaker it's going to get, and, and the less you know processing and recall ability we're going to have, and ultimately we're going to feel, I think, less proud of the stuff that we do if we all just let AI create everything for us. So I do think that things like creative endeavors are going to be important. So if you know, I like to play music, for example, and that's something I don't want AI to do for me. Like I, I don't mind struggling at the piano or the guitar because it's it's enjoyable for me to to see that sort of building of skill. And I think we need to find ways or find things outside our our jobs that we can engage that sort of creative aspect of our minds that that allow us to feel ownership of of some skill building. So. I don't know if that's uh, any reprieve to all of the distressing the uh, findings from the study, but that's how I see it, at least in the sense that we are in the society now that is using AI, that is using large language models to optimize productivity. And I don't think we can completely bury our head in the sand and avoid these tools. But I think the important part is knowing how to put the tools down and when to put them away for the day and to say, hey, it's time to use my own brain for something. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a different kind of a video on my channel, but if you like me breaking down these kinds of papers and giving my perspective on them, please let me know, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear what you think about this study and what stood out to you. And I hope to see you in future videos as well. So thanks for watching and I will see you next time.